Good afternoon. This special meeting of the Baltimore City Council is now called to order. At this time, I'll ask everyone in attendance to please silence your phones or put them on vibrate. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the council chambers. All council members, assembled dignitaries, members of the press, community leaders, and citizens of Baltimore to the Clarence Duburns Council Chambers as we gather to hear Mayor Scott's State of the City of Just. Give a, give a round of applause for that. <laughs> Obviously, we all know that this uh, chamber, as well as City Hall, has been uh, shut down due to COVID uh, for the past two years. Uh, so this is a momentous occasion, uh, not just as it relates to our mayor and being his first state of the city in front of the city, uh, but also as it relates to each and every one of you uh, to, wa to witness and watch government operate firsthand. So thank you all for coming out. It's my pleasure, again, to welcome uh, you unto this body. At this time, we're going to go into the invocation. Uh, this afternoon, it will be delivered by Rabbi Eton Mintz of Benai Israel Synagogue. Rabbi Mintz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Mayor Scott, Council President, Council Members, honored city leaders, clergy, citizens of Baltimore, and all those present here today in person and virtually. Shalom and blessings. We find ourselves in our most auspicious time of the year, in the very first month in the biblical calendar, the month of Nisan, within which lies the celebration of Passover, marking freedom from the oppression of Egypt and the release from all that which constricts us and holds us back. And we also find ourselves in the broader period of the spring, in Hebrew, Aviv, which in fact is one of the names of Passover, Chag HaAviv, as Passover by design must always be celebrated in this time of the calendar. For Pesach, the holiday of the Aviv is a season of renewal, rebirth, and redemption. It is therefore a most appropriate time for us as a broader community here to reflect on the past year and to look forward to aspire, to dream, to hope, and to pray for what can be and what should be. Every Shabbat prior to the new month, we have a tradition to bless the upcoming period and to request blessings from the Almighty. In that vein, and as we sit in this most auspicious season of renewal, I adapt this sacred prayer and I ask that you all join me as the mayor ushers in the upcoming year that it should be, that it should be with goodness and for blessing. Friends, let us pray. Yehi Ratzon, may it be your will, Hashem, our God and the God of our forefathers, that you inaugurate this month upon us for goodness and for blessing. May you give us, give us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of sustenance, a life of physical health, a life which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin, a life which there is no, no shame nor humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life which we will have love of Torah and fear of heaven, a life in which our heartfelt requests will be fulfill, full, fulfilled for the good. Amen, and let us say, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Mintz. Uh, now we will state the Pledge of Allegiance. If everybody could stand to their feet and turn to the flag. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Joining us to perform our national anthem is Mr. William Brown. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets reglare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there 
Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? If you could remain standing. Um, thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next up, we're going to uh, be joined um, by a performance of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, please welcome Ms. Elaine McIver. Uh, Ms. McIver, the floor is yours. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has brought us. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on to victory is one. Now you may be seated. Uh, thank you again to uh, Mr. Brown and Ms. McGyver for that amazing delivery of um, our national anthem and lift every voice and sing. At this time, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll of the members. President Mosby, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Conway, Pfeiffer, Middleton, Torrance, Burnett, Bullock, Porter, Costello, Stokes, Glover, Ramos. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, I would like to ask our esteemed Vice President of the Baltimore City Council, Ms. Sharon Green Middleton, to stand uh, and note any dignitaries that are in the room. I yield the floor to you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, Sharon Green Middleton, um, on behalf of my fellow colleagues, council members, I'd like to recognize um, visitors and dignitaries that we have today. I'll start with um, our state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, is here with us today. We, we also have uh, Comptroller Bill Henry. And we also have representatives from uh, Congressman Kwaisi Mfume's office. Senator Van Hollen's office and Senator Ben Cardin's office, and also we have present with us our um, agency heads that um, we definitely appreciate the work that you do for our city. Thank you. No, thank you, Madam Vice. <laughs> thank you, Madam Vice President. At this time, we're going to have a prayer offered by Pastor Antoine Burton of Changing Life Ministries. Pastor Burton, the floor is yours. Every eye closed, every head bowed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for who you are in our lives, for this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you for allowing us to gather on today. We invite your presence even into this room on today. God, we ask you right now that you would bless every elected official. Thank you for every servant that served the city of Baltimore even now. God, we ask you that you would bless our mayor, God, that you will continue to download wisdom as he lead and guide our city. God, there is a new day on the horizon, and God, we shall reach it collectively. 
God allow us to take on the mindset of Nehemiah as he and the people rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the wall. And God allow us to take on that mindset. Nehemiah didn't just do it alone, but the people had a mind to work. God allow us to come together as Baltimoreans to repair this great city. God, we thank you for our leader. We thank you for our mayor. We thank you for his vision, his passion, his tenacity for this city. Continue to surround him with people, God, that will push him, that will encourage him, that will challenge him even now. And God, we thank you for the good things that you're about to do in the city of Baltimore. Thank you for the new day and new season that we shall embark upon. And we will be careful to give your name all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Burton. Uh, at this time, it's my duty to appoint uh, a committee. Uh, to escort our 52nd mayor of the city of Baltimore into the council chambers, Brandon M. Scott. The committee will consist of Council Chairwoman McRae, uh, Council Member Burnett, and Councilwoman Porter. Will the escort committee please greet the mayor and accompany him into the chambers? Uh, when the Sergeant of Arms introduces the mayor as he's coming into the chambers, I ask everyone to stand at that time as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. President, Mr. Comptroller, members of this esteemed body, faithful clergy, and the residents of our great city, I stand before you this afternoon to share with you the state of Baltimore. It is the greatest honor of my life to serve as the 52nd mayor of our city, and I remain committed to seeing Baltimore reach its full potential. I am excited to be here with you today in person now that City Hall has reopened to the public. But I want to take a moment of silence to recognize our first responders and public safety workers who lost their lives in the line of duty serving the residents of Baltimore. Officer Kiana Holly, Lieutenant Paul Buttram, Lieutenant Kelsey Sadler, Firefighter EMT Kenny Lacayo, and our Safe Streets workers, Dante Barksdale, Kenya Wilson, and Deshaun McGreal.
Not only did they commit their lives to making Baltimore a better and safer place, they made the ultimate sacrifice in selflessly serving their city. To Commissioner Harrison, Chief Ford, Director Jackson, and all of our public safety staff, I want to acknowledge the diligent work that you do to protect Baltimoreans every day, especially throughout the pandemic. Before I took office, the health department under the leadership of our brilliant health commissioner, Dr. Jarazza, was already doing the great work and has been a guiding light in helping us navigate this deadly pandemic. Sadly, we've lost 1,728 Baltimoreans to this virus, 328 this year alone. But while I may receive the credit for making the tough decisions, I know we would have lost thousands of more if we didn't have Dr. D's leadership, expertise, guidance, and foresight as we took science-based actions to protect our residents. Dr. D. <laughs> Dr. D, thank you for a job well done. But as you would say, let us all be reminded, this pandemic is not over. There will be other variants and other surges, and this will not be the last pandemic that Baltimore faces. When I contemplated how we would spend the enormous funding from the American Rescue Plan, I knew that our health department would be the first recipient. This $80 million investment is about setting Baltimore up to ensure that we are prepared for the next surge and the next pandemic while also strengthening Baltimore's healthcare ecosystem, no matter what their zip code is for Baltimoreans. Baltimoreans will have access to quality, equitable healthcare. The public health of Baltimore residents remains my top priority as we navigate the pandemic and cope with this new sense of normalcy. This investment helped us provide tens of thousands of COVID tests, dedicated testing staff, funding to develop telehealth infrastructure for Baltimore healthcare clinics, and the purchase of PPE. I would also be remiss if I didn't recognize my parents council person, Councilman Scheifler, for his partnership in setting up the AccuReference testing site and vaccination clinic in Northwest Baltimore. Uh, this site served thousands of Baltimoreans during the height of the Omicron surge, including many of our homebound residents, and it's where I received my booster shot in my barbershop, no less. Showing again uh, that when Baltimoreans unite, we can achieve anything, even overcome a global pandemic. Thank you. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge and honor the outstanding work done by the team at the Office of Emergency Management, led by Chief Wallace. In response to the pandemic, the Emergency Operations Center was fully activated for an unprecedented 738 consecutive days. I want to give a special shout out to the entire team at the EOC for working overtime to support our agencies as they serve the residents of our city. Let's give EO the Emergency Center a round of applause. Thank you. I also want to recognize our frontline workers for getting us through the worst of the pandemic. Healthcare workers stepped up in a big way and we owe them a huge amount of gratitude. However, our home healthcare professionals haven't been acknowledged on the same scale as other essential workers. Despite this, they have continued to serve our families often in lieu of seeing their own. In light of this, I am partnering with the SEIU 1199 to fund $2 million in compensation to give these workers the appreciation and recognition that they deserve. <laughs> Overall, the pandemic has underscored the importance of our essential workforce. And under my direction, the Department of Human Resources conducted a series of salary studies to improve the competitiveness of city positions and compare it to our similar jurisdictions. And we are partnering with the City Union of Baltimore 
to ensure that the city is able to hire and retain the best and brightest employees, starting uh, by raising the salaries of 752 Cub employees who deserve it deeply. I want to thank my partners in government, the council president, the comptroller, the entire city council, and our state and federal delegations. Without each of you, we wouldn't be able to set Baltimore on a path to recover from the pandemic and build Baltimore back better and more equitably. But Baltimore, let's be honest. When I came into office, city government was broken and rotten to the core from years of dysfunction, turmoil, and misplaced focus. We had to start from scratch and build new systems from the foundation up, no longer putting new windows on a house with no roof. But together, we are paving a new path forward for our city, and the proof of that is evident. We are resilient, we are proud, and we will win against all odds. We are also a city where excellence, black excellence, abounds. Much like the CIAA, we had plenty, a long list, Mr. President, of naysayers when we talked about going after the CIAA. The oldest black athletic conference and lowering their tournament away from Charlotte to Baltimore. Well, Baltimore, I am pleased to report that you showed up and showed out for the 2022 CIAA tournament. <laughs> 66,000 fans attended the tournament with the championship games drawing over 13,000 spectators to the Royal Farms Arena, surpassing 2019's championship day in Charlotte by nearly 4,000 people. CIAA visitors drove early hotel revenue over an estimated $3.2 million, which is the highest hotel revenue for the last weekend in February since 2015. The average, highest daily average rate since 2007. In addition to great basketball and a huge economic impact for our city, the CIAA celebrated HBCUs and black excellence, and we were able to do all of this safely during a pandemic. <laughs> CIAA is an example of what we can achieve when we dream big, collaborate with our partners who understand our passion for uplifting our city's strength instead of magnifying our weaknesses. Imagine what we're going to be able to accomplish in 23. Under my administration, we are completing a long, 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 long awaited and much debated renovation of the Royal Farms Arena. And we have to give a huge thank you to our partners at the Oak Food Group and Councilman Burnett, the best basketball player in the world, Kevin Durant. <laughs> we are excited to see this transformational project begin, and I commend the project team on their commitment to include minority and women-owned businesses. This project will create over 500 construction jobs over the next 12 months, and a new arena will re-energize our downtown, complement planned west side investments, and help attract even more events and visitors. Together, we can build a better Baltimore by leveraging the power of collaboration. And while we cannot overlook the impact of COVID, we cannot ignore the fact that our city is still plagued uh, with gun violence, as it has been for decades. Last year, we lost 338 lives to violence. Children like Malia Turner, mothers, grandmothers like Evelyn Player, and too many more who will never spend time with their families or grow to reach their full potential. And unfortunately, this year has started off the same way, and it is clear that the effects of violence impact everyone in every neighborhood in our city. Yes, it is true uh, that we are part of the national trend of increased violence. However, we cannot accept it as okay or normal, and we are not and will not be deterred in our efforts to disrupt it. We are focusing on holding violent offenders accountable and getting them off their streets. Thus far this year, we've made 363 gun arrests and recovered 573 illegal guns, including 142 guns used 
in violent crimes and 113 ghost guns. In collaboration with our law enforcement partners, the Warrant Apprehension Task Force has served 810 warrants for violent crimes, including murder, attempted murder, rape, carjackings, and armed robbery. Our homicide rate is over 50%, which is up 13% from last year. I want to commend the entire BPD for the serving our residents to make Baltimore a safer place every single day. But if we continue with the status quo, we will continue to get status quo results. That is why we are doing the work to ensure that police resources are being used effectively and constitutionally. And to that end, we have developed several initiatives that are part of our strategy to reimagine policing. These are all changes that our residents have told us that they want to see as we move closer toward creating a safer future for Baltimore. Our reimagining policing strategy will allow us to modernize policing and transform BPD into a world-class law enforcement agency. We have updated BPD's staffing model to maximize limited sworn resources, allowing our police to tap into qualified personnel that can advance through the hiring process faster. And in this body, it is no secret uh, that police redistricting in Baltimore is long overdue. Population, workload, crime trends, even individual neighborhoods have changed dramatically in the decades since our district boundaries were last redrawn. This is why, as second district councilman, I worked with my senator, Corey McRae, to ensure we are changing our districts regularly to account for our consistently evolving city. And now that work has begun. But no matter which neighborhood I'm in, residents let me know that they want their police officers focused on violence in Baltimore. However, our patrol officers spend half of their time focused on non-emergency calls where there is no one in danger. In the coming weeks, we will be unveiling our smart policing program, emphasizing uh, innovative policing by having officers focus on what and where our residents need them to be. By implementing a smart policing strategy, we can free up valuable time spent by our officers on these non-emergency calls so they can be more proactive and have more visibility patrolling our communities and making them safe. Frankly, all of these initiatives are long overdue, and I know that some of them will cause controversy. However, as I stated when I was sworn in, I am dedicated to doing the right thing regardless of criticism. We need to evolve in order to build the capacity not to just solve crimes, but also to prevent them from happening in the first place. I'll be discussing these initiatives in more detail in the near future, and I look forward to working with our elected leaders and our constituents to implement this strategy. But if we have learned anything from Baltimore's decades of struggle with violence, it should be that police alone will not solve our problems. This is why I created the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and we are rounding out year one, the foundation building year of the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan, through which we are setting a new tone in city government, and it, we know that it will take a collaborative, all hands on deck approach and strategy centered around community-centered collaborations that address violence while strengthening ties in the community. I invested $50 million to accelerate the development of our violence prevention work and support organizations operating on the front lines to build a safer Baltimore. The responsibility to prevent violence falls on all of us, not one person, not one agency. My plan is for us to collectively reduce crime. We are forging a wide-ranging coalition of law enforcement across all levels of government to address the violence that plagues our city from every possible angle. That is why not only city, but state and federal agencies are involved, like in the newly reestablished Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. I restarted this CJCC to end the finger pointing and the blaming 
and most importantly, to put Baltimoreans back at the forefront of our conversations and strategies to improve our justice system. This year, we have been working hard to start our group violence reduction strategy. Uh, in partnership with BPD and the state's attorney's office, we launched GVRS in the Western District in January. In Baltimore, this time, we will get it right. We are focused on and are reaching those in the Western who are at the highest risk of either being the victim or the shooter with critical life-saving support and services. But I want to be clear, for those who do not take that support, there will be law enforcement consequences, so choose wisely. And we are working to bring this work to additional districts in year two. All of us know uh, that Safe Streets has been a crucial part of our work to change the way we approach public safety. And we are preparing to release the findings and recommendations of the Safe Streets internal evaluation. I tasked Monsi uh, with this evaluation with a goal of providing stronger oversight, accountability, and support to Safe Streets. This is about how we ensure the safety of our violence interrupters who have already mediated more than 455 conflicts this year alone. It is also about providing the training and career pathways that they deserve. And I've said before uh, that our public safety strategies will not be effective if they are disconnected, one-off, or incomplete. We must connect our efforts, leverage our assets as a city, and meet our residents who bear the brunt of violent incidents right where they are. In the coming weeks, I will outline my vision for a community violence intervention ecosystem for Baltimore. And expanding the capacity of Safe Streets is just one key piece of this CVI ecosystem. It is also about caring for victims with services like intensive life coaching, hospital violence intervention, school-based response, and other wraparound support. This approach works and is supported by the White House as a best practice to reduce violent crime in partnership with our communities. This shift in strategy from past efforts will help us cover more than the 2.6 square miles of a 90 square mile city that Safe Streets currently covers. Change is happening and violent, and violent crimes is being addressed right now and will continue to be addressed. As your neighbor and your mayor, I want you to know that we are all in this together. Looking at the year ahead, uh, the city of Baltimore is well positioned to double down on our progress as we work to stem the tide of violence, and we are gearing up to launch a Returning Citizens Behind the Wall initiative, which will provide safe return plans, training, and wraparound support, but most importantly, pay returning citizens $15 an hour to clean Baltimore before and after release. <laughs> Baltimore has provided post-arrest diversion services for youth for more than a decade. Under my leadership, Monty has launched our sidestep pre-arrest diversion pilot for West Baltimore youth and we are seeing the fruits of our labor and will continue to invest in the futures of our young people, not their failures. It's no secret uh, that our fire department has been through so much this year, and we see uh, where they need to better support uh, to serve our residents. In order to adequately support the women and men of the fire department, we are making much needed investments in the 2023 budget, including allocating $5 million to create two new EMS units. Uh, we will further reduce the burden on EMS staff and improve response time by setting up population health and nurse triage programs. And last, but certainly not least, in partnership with the state and in honor of the heroes that we lost their lives in January, we are rebuilding Engine 14. That was a second home to Lieutenant Sadler and firefighter EMT Lacayo. In partnership with Councilman Burnett, we're investing a half a million dollars in the upcoming budget to create opportunities for our young people through paid apprenticeships, Madam Vice President, within our fire department. 
We need Baltimoreans to stay engaged and continue to be active participants as we progress in building this new era of public safety in Baltimore. I encourage everyone to look at the great work organizations like we are us are doing to get involved in this effort. Every man in Baltimore should be a member of We Are Us. This work is going to take everyone buying into a unified and comprehensive vision to make Baltimore a safer place for us all. Baltimore's young people are the key to this brighter future. And I know uh, that we can realize this vision by investing in them with not only our resources, but even more importantly, with our time. And it is no secret that our school system has been underfunded for decades. Our students, like the council president and I, have been forced to learn in aging buildings, and our teachers have been undervalued for far too long. I set out to change that. When we began the process to implement the blueprint for Maryland's future, in this chamber, I said that the city would do our part and challenge every agency to help us get there. Today, I am proud to announce that in my upcoming budget, we are investing over $65 million more million into our city school system. <laughs> this will help us continue and build on the progress made, like the record six new school buildings opened through the 21st Century Schools Program this year. We are now showing our young people that they matter and that their futures matter. In February, I announced my $120 million vision for recreation and parks. I was joined by community partners in laying this new unified vision to support our young people and our communities. We will no longer compete for scarce resources, but instead work together. And I'm excited to announce uh, that Kaboom has named Baltimore as their first official partner in their 25 and 5 initiative to end place-based inequity. We are coming together to show our residents, especially our young people, that they matter. We are putting our money where our mouth is, providing them with safe, modern spaces to exercise, spend their time productively, and of course, for me, foster excellence through healthy competition. We will put more effort into their promise than their struggles, more in their support than their shackles, and more in their dreams than their downfalls. This is how we are truly going to build public safety in Baltimore. Growing up, Madam Vice President, I basically lived in our rec centers. I am living proof of the profound impact that Rec and Parks has on our communities. They can literally save lives. I would not be here today without Tawanda, C.C. Jackson, or J.D. Gross. And I want our young people to be able to have that same connection to their local rec center in their community. That is why I was so excited to reopen rec centers that had been closed for years, like Tawanda and Bocek, and while we opened the brand new Cahill Fitness Center last year. Just a few years ago, Baltimore had 40 rec centers across our city. Today, we have 52, and this year, we will open the 53rd, the incredible new uh, middle branch facility in Cherry Hill, Madam Councilwoman. Uh, we will also be building a new Furley Rec Center as a part of the new Furley Elementary. And Councilman Torrance, we are building the new Parkview Rec Center in West Baltimore, and we will also reopen Drew Hill Park Pool this summer. I want all of us, our young people, our seniors, and families to have access to the rec centers, parks, public pools, and athletic courts they deserve. We all know that Baltimore, this chamber, is the birthplace of redlining. That legacy shows up in the stark inequalities of our city still present today. Almost a year ago, I announced that Baltimore was taking the first steps to establish a guaranteed income pilot program. Research shows that guaranteed income projects have resulted in lower poverty, higher earnings, and savings. 
Guaranteed income has proven to be a key tool in improving economic mobility and advancing racial and gender equity. This is an investment in the future of our city and our young families by providing direct support so they can thrive. And I am excited to announce that the application will go live on May the 2nd for Baltimore's Guaranteed Income Pilot Program. We are partnering uh, with the Cash Campaign of Maryland to administer the program and they bring a wealth of experience in benefits counseling and wraparound support services. Two weeks ago, we kicked off the 2022 Youth Work season. Last year, for the first time in some time, we offered a summer job to every young person that completed their Youth Works application. And this year, we're gonna do it again. So, I'm calling on all area employers, large or small, nonprofit, faith and community organizations to plan for your futures today by hiring through Youth Works for your summer needs. We want to ensure that every young person that wants to work doesn't miss an opportunity to do so. And there is still time for young people and employers to sign up to participate. In this year's program, uh, as well as something that I'm about to announce, Last fall, I allocated $8 million in, in funding to Youth Works to allow the city to serve 4,000 youth over two summers and provide employment opportunities for 100 youth uh, during the school year for the, through the first ever year-round Youth Works Academy, which we have launched. Responsible, responsible stewardship of city resources is something that I was lucky on promise to ensure. And we are changing the way that city government operates. When the federal government announced offer and we thankfully received $641 million to help us bounce back stronger from the pandemic, I established the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs to ensure we equitably make strategic investments in Baltimore's future. And I remain committed to this being a transparent process. To that end, I created the Offer Reporting Center, which allows the public to monitor investments made through the city's offer allocation. I want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank our congressional delegation, Senator Cardin, Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Infume, Rubens Berger, and Saul Baines for their partnership, advocacy, and support in our efforts to secure this historic investment and progress Baltimore forward. Improving our water system is a key part of our work to ensure that we're being responsible with taxpayer dollars. And we all know our water infrastructure is old and our bills are too high for our residents. I'm committed to making water bills more affordable for our residents while also renovating this aging infrastructure and this work is already paying off. As mayor, I have made sure to finally enact the Water Accountability and Equity Act to provide much needed relief from water bills to low income residents. I want to thank Council Vice President Middleton for all of her hard work to make this possible. <laughs> Through the creation of Water for All, which is a groundbreaking uh, groundbreaking for Baltimore and one of only two programs of its kind in the nation that provides comprehensive income-based protections to both tenants and homeowners. Earlier this year, the EPA announced $396 in financing to the city of Baltimore to modernize water infrastructure across Baltimore, focusing on supporting low-end communities and communities of color in East and West Baltimore. Through WIFIA, the city will save approximately $100 million that can be used to support other initiatives, including Water for All. And today, I am so pleased to announce that the 10% more per year water rate increases are a thing of the past. Our new, <laughs> Our new water rate increases for the next three years will be an average of 3.2%.
For our customers, that means that for the next three years, your typical bill will only increase about $3.76 per year, and that 3.2% increase is also less than the current rate of inflation, which is at 7.9%. I can't talk about the responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollars without mentioning our innovative use of data. Uh, my staff knows one of my most famous quotes that I borrowed from Jay-Z, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, so show me the data. <laughs> it's about using proven strategies to maximize transparency and accountability. Under my leadership, many of our agencies are already engaged in meaningful and sophisticated work using data to better understand and improve the operations of our of city government for our residents. The city of Baltimore is effectively using data to improve residents' lives and our being one of 50 cities uh, that received the What Works City certification clearly indicates that. We are transparently administrating a once in a lifetime allocation, creating innovative programs to benefit our most at risk residents and doing all while being responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. The last time I met with Bishop Douglas Miles, he told me many things, but the thing he wanted me to focus on the most and that he said twice is that we needed a comprehensive housing strategy, including uh, uh, reducing vacant houses that have been plaguing our communities for generations. And under my administration, we are going to build more equitable communities across Baltimore and reduce the amount of vacant homes. Last month, uh, we announced $100 million in funding to kickstart our equitable housing strategy. Our residents in Park Heights and Shum and Uplands and O'Donnell Heights and Perkins in East Baltimore will see activity after decades of waiting. This coordinated... <laughs> This coordinated strategy will help us address the dual challenges of disinvestment and middle income flight from Baltimore's neighborhoods. And through Live Baltimore, uh, I am investing a half million dollars in the upcoming budget to incentivize more black and brown families to return and stick around in our great city. Part of this investment is also historic investment to reduce vacant homes. Working shoulder to shoulder with Baltimore's communities and leaders at Build, we have identified $39 million to strategically reduce the number of vacant buildings in our city. This funding, coupled with the action-oriented recommendations from my Vacancy Review Task Force, will be the difference for our communities who have been waiting and what they have been waiting for. We have already begun to operationalize recommendations made through the Vacant Property Review with the help of Councilwoman Ramos, and we are removing owner-occupied homes from tax sale, providing relief on unpaid property taxes, increasing investments in demolition and stabilization, and we are rehabilitating vacant properties. Uh, we launched buy-in to be more so that potential buyers can access programs and resources and bring properties back into productive use. But, yeah, call for that. In addition, I announced $90 million in February that will allow the city to implement best practices to make homelessness brief, rare, and non-recurring in Baltimore. Uh, but as we continue our pursuit of equitable neighborhood development across our city, we must not forget our older residents. Our older residents are the residents who lived through Baltimore's racist policies and who bore the brunt of housing inequity. We must ensure that they have the necessary resources to age in place with the dignity and grace that they deserve. Uh, this is why I announced over $16 million in funding to support the continuation of the housing upgrades to benefit seniors program 
which provides modifications, repairs, and wraparound services for older adult homeowners. In addition, yeah, let's clap for that. In addition to the investment, we have also taken legislative action to protect our legacy homeowners. In partnership with my councilwoman, Councilwoman McCray, uh, the city launched its tax sale exemption program to protect owner-occupied properties from going to tax sale. This is part of our larger strategy to reform the city's antiquated tax sale process and protect our long-term residents. I salute the councilwoman for leading this effort in the council and am grateful for the agility of our agencies to operationalize this new initiative. And I, <laughs> and I can't speak about equitable neighborhood development in Baltimore and not mention the staple that is Lexington Market. Last month, I was pleased to allocate $5 million to complete the redevelopment of Lexington Market uh, for the diverse merchants who will call the new market home, with over 50% of them being minority owners. <laughs> These funds are going directly to vendors to help us reach the finish line for opening this uniquely Baltimore destination this summer while ensuring that minority business are at the center of our work to grow the downtown economy. We are putting $500,000 in the 2023 budget to identifying more minority and women owned business and getting them involved with the city's contract and procurement system to take this work even further. Uh, just over a week ago, uh, we received some great news. A Baltimorean, a true Baltimorean, Tim Regan, had acquired the old target space at Mondawmin with plans to redevelop the space into a community hub designed to spur neighborhood realization. I am sincerely grateful and honestly excited about what this investment represents. But we can't have equitable neighborhood development without equitable workforce development. That is why I made the largest investment in job training and supportive programs like Train Up in our city's history. We are now partnering with over 20 community-based nonprofits so that 9,000 Baltimoreans will receive free job training in healthcare, construction, manufacturing, IT, and hospitality. All of these opportunities will lead to a job, and they come with critical support services, including legal assistance, behavioral health counseling, literacy, and financial empowerment services. We are putting Baltimoreans back to work, like a Ms. Shatija Butler from East Baltimore, who, through Moore's partnership with the Jane Adams and Resource Center, will turn, uh, will in a, and she turns 22 in a couple days, who is on her way to becoming a certified welder. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> this isn't business as usual. Through these initiatives, we are engaging in real equitable neighborhood development in the birthplace of redlining, improving public safety and community health by eliminating the excess of vacants in our communities redeveloping the nation's longest continuously operating public market, and even working to make homelessness a rarity in Baltimore. But the well-being of our residents is my priority, and we cannot truly build clean and healthy communities without addressing the condition of our neighborhoods and improving city services that they depend on, like transportation. In partnership with Councilman Dorsey, I adopted Baltimore City's first complete streets manual, establishing a project prioritization process centered around equity and safety. And we are making our streets more accessible by investing $3 million to improve uh, funding to improve and ensure that every ramp, sidewalk, and traffic signal is ADA compliant. And last fall, uh, we announced with Secretary Pete Buttigieg and the Maryland Department of Transportation, the $50 million raise grant. And through this, we are creating a corridor, the East-West Bus Transit Corridor, that better serves transportation needs of our residents by 
adding additional dedicated bus lanes, bus stops enhancements in more than 100 different locations, including benches, shelters, real-time signage, and ADA upgrades along the 10-mile route served by the blue and orange lines. These bus routes connect several residential communities and critical employment centers, including Social Security, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, Downtown, and Bayview. There are more than 180,000 jobs along the corridor. Thank you, and thank you to the leadership of our federal partners. The East-West Priority Corridor Project will further improve efforts to improve safety, accessibility, and facilitate faster and more reliable transit for our residents. When I took office, I instructed DOT to review the Charm City Circulator to assess the current routes and determine where improvements can be made. And I am proud to share that over the next few weeks, we will release a draft transit development plan for public comment. This plan recommends changes to these routes based on a data equity-driven evaluation. The proposed changes make meaningful connections from where people live to shopping and employment centers and other destinations, including grocery stores and hospitals. The routes emphasize the neighborhoods with the highest percentage of households who don't have access to cars so we can close the transportation gaps in places that MTA buses don't cover. These proposed changes are also within the current budget for the program, and I look forward to sharing this draft plan with you and working together to implement these equitable changes. And Councilwoman Porter, I'm proud to announce today that the circulator is coming to Cherry Hill. And in the spirit of cleaning up our communities, we're also looking at the city's carbon footprint and what other ways we can reduce emissions and protect our environment. This year, we set the goal of achieving 100% carbon neutrality by 2045. I wanna thank Councilman Conway for leading the efforts from the council to pass legislation that will put the city of Baltimore at the forefront of setting climate resiliency goals for the region. Baltimore, we are on the cusp of a long overdue renaissance, and we are doing the work to ensure that it happens, not just for us, but for the generations to come. But we still have so much to do, and I am committed to seeing this work through to completion. Next month, the world will look to Baltimore as we host the Preakness States. In Baltimore, I want you to know that I am doing the work so that the eyes of the world are on us the other 364 days of the year. But before I close, I have a special announcement. And when I was growing up, Harbor Place was a destination, a place that Baltimore's and people from out of town were excited to visit. But it has been on a steady decline for years, no longer living up to its reputation or its promise. And since taking off office last December, I've been constantly asked about what the future will hold for this once destination location. But today, all of that changes. Today, West Baltimore's very own David Bramble has announced that he has the right to bring private investment for a revitalized Harbor Place. Today, we start a new chapter for Harbor Place, bringing both, yeah. bringing Baltimore vision, Baltimore community investment, and Baltimore style to transform Harbor Place into a landmark destination where residents can go to enjoy the best that we have to offer. Thriving small businesses, green space, and cultural venues. Dave has my full support and the support of my entire administration as he navigates the receivership process and works to bring hundreds of millions of dollars of investment into this part of the city. And on top of that, we're reopening the visitor center for the first time in Inner Harbor since the start of the pandemic to show that Baltimore is ready to welcome all to our great city. I say that to emphasize that our city is thriving 
and we will continue to prosper. Recently, we were named as one of the best cities in the country for millennial families. We were ranked in the top 100 best cities for young professionals, and to top it all, one of our two esteemed Baltimore HBCUs of the national tre treasure, the university I call Baltimore's University, Morgan State University, was recognized as one of the top 10 producers of STEM graduates in the U.S. <laughs> Dr. Wilson, who is with us today, uh, I want to congratulate you, not just on that, but on your upcoming expansion to the Lake Clifton campus. <laughs> so I say, Mr. President, Mr. Comptroller, members of this body, clergy, and all of Baltimore, that we've been through a lot together in the past two years, and we've still been able to advance by leaps and bounds. Baltimore is rising, that's a fact. Violent crime and gun violence will continue to be addressed. Our communities are being restored, and the way in which our city government operates is being revived. I encourage you all, if you haven't already, to get involved in your community and in the work that we have outlined today, that is how we will shape a better future for Baltimore. Baltimore, I remain your faithful servant, humble serving son. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, today's benediction will be offered by Iman Akhil uh, Ingram of Masjid Uark. Uh, uh, Iman Ingram, the floor is yours. Greetings, Baltimore. Charm City, the greatest city in America. The quality of life challenges the city is facing is not unaware to any of us. The socioeconomic challenges the city is facing we are all well aware. Along with this, we must acknowledge the efforts that are being made, the efforts that are being had by Mayor Brandon Scott and his administration, city council, dignitaries, and other parties that are present and not present with us, all the way down to the many citizens on the ground. We acknowledge that we are in need of our Lord, in need of strength, in need of empowerment from our Lord. But that also does not negate responsibility that we must carry on the ground. For this reason, we ask our Lord that he makes us more so a people of progression and not regression. That he makes us more so a people of love and less a people of hate. That he makes us more so a people of building and less a people of destruction. Baltimore indeed is rising. We submit to you some words of our Lord from the magnificent Quran, where he swears by his creation that we call time. And he states in this chapter, by the time, all of humanity is in an utter state of loss, except for those who have faith, who put forth righteous deeds, and mutually advise one another with truth, and mutually advise one another with patience. We pray to our Lord, we supplicate to our Lord, Allah, the Almighty, the Magnificent, the All-Wise, the Compassionate, and we invocate to him and we say, Amin. Health, wealth, love, happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Yaman Ingram. Uh, this concludes the business before the desk of this special meeting of your Baltimore City Council. On behalf of Mayor Scott and the members of the council, I would like to thank each and every one of you who have assembled uh, in City Hall today for this momentous occasion. 
Um, for folks who are watching us at home, thank you for joining as well. The council's next meeting is Monday, April the 25th at 5 p.m. here in the city council chambers. Thank you, Baltimore. We love you.